This enjoy. Whether you've joined us live here in Channing Hall or you're on Zoom, we welcome you to our worship service and it's wonderful to be together today. We extend a special welcome to our visitors. We're so happy that you've stopped by and we encourage you to stop by our newcomer table after the service so that we can get you any information that you'd like about our congregation. We have a lot of stuff happening here and you're invited to all of it. Thank you for visiting UU Princeton this morning. We have a couple of announcements. There are some things coming up very soon. Today, Alan Oliver, a longtime Unitarian Universalist and Buddhist with strong ties to our Buddhist meditation group, will be offering a talk in Foz Theater at noon today titled God Practice, Choosing the Path of Evolving Process. His God Practice has been shaped by Lutheran Protestantism, Unitarian Universalism, and Buddhism. It'll be a great talk. That's today at noon in Foz Theater. Also, you are invited to learn about and discuss our congregation's work in partnering with Interfaith RISE to potentially offer temporary emergency housing to refugees or asylum seekers here in the church building. We have a Zoom-only discussion scheduled for this Wednesday at 6 p.m. and an in-person discussion session scheduled for after worship next Sunday. You can keep an eye on your email for more information about both of those opportunities. Speaking of our worship service next Sunday, we have an announcement from Margie Herman, our Director of Music. Well, I'm sure you know by now that next week is a special week for the music ministry. We're going to put on our or present to you or offer to you our annual All Music Sunday. And the reason I'm making this announcement is because we really want the congregation to be involved this year. And there's an announcement in the middle of your order of service today. You can read all about it. But I just wanted to urge you, if you feel so moved, to drop me a line. My email is in the order of service with your thoughts about grace. It can be one word, two words, three sentences. It's not ask, we're not asking you to write the tome about grace, just your, your reactions and thoughts about it. So I'd appreciate hearing from you and I look forward to seeing you all next Sunday. I would take that as a challenge. Send Margie your tomes. Send her all the tomes you have on grace. Send them in. <laughs> and now friends on this holy day, let us gather in peace and unity as one before the grace and grandeur of life, as children before its great and loving mystery. In this hour, may we know anew the holy joy of human lives growing together so that this hour will shape all those to come with that same blessing. Come, let us worship together. Today's chalice lighting comes from the Buddha. Don't try to calm the storm. Calm yourself. The storm will pass. A Buddha's Prayer by Matt Alspa. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. The breath of life. Inhale. Inspire. Inspiration. Ruach, Numa, Spiritus, the Holy Spirit, the many names for breath. Breathe with me. Know that with each breath we take in molecules of air that, that were breathed by every person that ever lived. Breathe with me and breathe the breath of Jesus, of Moses, of Mohammed, of the Buddha, breathe with me. And know that we are all interdependent, that the spirit of life flows through all of us. Breathe with me. As we come together to, the, to do the holy work of interconnection and relationship, that our work here may be blessed. Amen. I'm not feeling very calm these days. And here's one of the reasons why. 
Before beginning to write this reflection, I was attacked by my eight month old puppy, Walter. I mentioned Walter in a reflection back in June. At that point, we were super excited about welcoming him into our family. And we were going to name him Bernie because he's a Bernie doodle, which is a mix between a Bernese mountain dog and a poodle. We knew having a dog was going to be a lot of work, but we were still looking forward to it. When we got him, Walter had what we knew to be normal puppy behaviors, going to the bathroom on the rug, chewing on everything except his chew toys, and nipping at our hands and feet because he didn't yet understand the social hierarchy and thought we were puppies too. Fast forward to now, he's basically stopped chewing on taboo objects and very rarely pees on the living room rug anymore. As for the nipping, well, it's unfortunately gotten worse. He can be perfectly docile and lovely, but then he has these moments where he gets the devil in him and he starts biting. Not enough to draw blood, thank goodness, but it definitely hurts and it definitely doesn't seem like it's ever going to stop. We've been working with a trainer who reassures us Walter isn't a bad dog. He just needs some direction. But when your ankles and wrists are constantly black and blue from being gnawed on, you do start to think that no amount of reinforcement, be it positive or negative, is going to help. I'm not a person who yells. I wouldn't call myself soft-spoken, but I avoid raising my voice at all costs. However, I do find it extremely difficult not to holler at Walter when he's being naughty. I go through the list of strategies the trainer has suggested, standing up straight and with assertion, sternly saying no and sit, gently pushing his rump down if he doesn't listen, squirting him with water if he really doesn't listen. Yelling at him is not on this list and for good reason. Every time I do it, Walter gets even naughtier. His being yelled at agitates him more and makes him that much wilder, which can be downright scary even though he only weighs 35 pounds. And he only really does this to me, not to my husband, not to my kids. So I'm starting to think he hates women. How could we have ever predicted we'd have a misogynistic dog? I fully realize that this is a first world problem and I should just suck it up and be grateful that we have the resources to own and properly take care of a dog but it's causing me a great deal of anxiety and stress in my own home. How can I find joy in all of the whirlwind that is Walter? Well, just, have written, just having written the word joy makes me realize there are ways in which our little mutt makes me smile. When I decide I'm going to try to make nice with him and sit on the floor for pets, Walter comes wagging over and sits in my lap. It's very cute and very sweet. And the science says that this sort of interaction lowers the stress hormone cortisol and increases levels of the feel-good hormone oxytocin. It also helps to lower blood pressure. And then there's walking him, which is good for me in the obvious ways of getting me outside and getting me moving. As someone who suffers from sometimes debilitating depression, I know that these things, rebalancing my chemicals, connecting with nature and exercising, are all helpful toward curbing or avoiding feeling blue. So yes, I was just attacked again, but I think I'll go find that crazy hound and give him a few good scratches on the belly and take him for a jaunt around the block. Don't be surprised though, if you see a very cute dog named Walter at the UUCP spring sale with a sign that says free to a good home. Once there was a group of monks living in an old stone hut next to a river. The river flooded once a year during the rainy season, but the water never went too high, and the monks learned to live in relative harmony with the ebb and flow of the riverbank. One year, however, the rainy season had been extra rainy. There were weeks of heavy storms with far more rainfall than usual. The river surged much faster than it ever had before, quickly flowing up to the stone hut, then surrounding it, and then continuing to rise such that the monks felt stuck there. The monks began to panic. The stone hut itself was old, and as the river surrounded it, the monks could imagine it completely falling apart. They realized that they would soon be in less of a hut on the side of a river than in a hut in the middle of a river at best. 
They feared becoming an island, and they knew that with the water rising this fast, they would need to get away from that river and go to higher ground. But they didn't know how to do that, for the water was already high, the current strong, and the storm continuing. They could imagine themselves being washed away as they tried to flee. Some froze in despair, unable to process the storm that engulfed them, even as the waters covered their ankles and feet in the hut. Others imagined that the storm wasn't real or wasn't really that bad. The waters will recede, they assured the others, even as the flood reached their knees. Some just ran around in frantic worry, not really doing anything to address the flood, even as the waters climbed up to their thighs. Others met to discuss the flood and formulate a plan of response, even as the water covered the tabletop around which they sat. A few even climbed onto the roof and stood in the rain to pray away the storm, even as the storm showed no signs of abating. It was then that some monks looked out of the window and saw off in the distance a group of villagers slowly approaching them. They appeared to be in a single line and seemed to be passing many items along the line up to the front and then placing them in the water before the first person. After a few of those items were passed along, the line would move forward just a little bit toward the monks and their hut. And even though the water was deeper as the villagers got closer to the hut and then closer and thus closer to the river, the water continued to only go up to their knees. The monks realized that the villagers were using big flat stones to make a more shallow path through the rising water and that they kept stacking stones as they needed to so that they could safely travel to the hut. The monks then decided to do this work on their end as well, and they started dismantling their hut and using those stones to build a path toward the villagers. Those who had frozen in fear came alive in purpose. Those who had imagined that nothing was wrong faced the circumstances and started moving. Those who had been frantic focused instead on the stones, one after another after another. Those who had met and discussed stood and worked. Those who had prayed with their mouths prayed with their hands instead, and they built a path that soon met one, the one that the villagers were creating, and as one big group they all went to higher ground, escaping the flood and starting their lives anew. We can imagine being one or more of those monks in response to the storms of life. Sometimes we all freeze or imagine that something overwhelming isn't overwhelming or just sort of lose it and freak out or try to slowly strategize our way through an immediate crisis. Sometimes we're all of those people in the same storm, passing through them like phases of the moon. And then something or someone will come along and the path will be made clear and our work becomes simple. Not necessarily easy or even safe, but simple. Take this path and take it together. Many of those characters are portrayed in some way in the movie Don't Look Up, the 2021 satire about a comet that threatens to destroy the Earth. A few scientists discover the comet, its size and speed and where it's headed and what that means for life on Earth and raise the alarm. In response, many people freak out. Many say it won't happen. Many meet to discuss things. The whole thing gets politicized in the media and in Washington, which early in the movie makes any happy ending very unlikely. And as this movie is commentary on the human caused environmental apocalypse, perhaps facing life on earth, it's a real downer of a movie, if well-made and funny in a pretty sad kind of way. I didn't sleep well that night. If you want a happier version of a similar storyline, read The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, which was on President Obama's best books list last year. Much to my initial disappointment, the ministry it refers to is the diplomatic kind, not the church kind. Nevertheless, if you stick with it for 560 pages that describe a human-caused environmental apocalypse perhaps facing life on Earth, you will end in a better place than the film. It just takes a lot longer. And you'll be introduced to people who respond in those similar ways to the storms in which they live. Some ignore them, some freeze, some lose it, some plan, and some do stuff. Often in our day to day though, the storms aren't as momentous or unusual. And they're not storms in the literal sense. 
but there are times when the conditions of life push and pull us this way and that. And we find ourselves overwhelmed and unsure of not only what to do, but how to even make the decision about what to do. We imagine strength, many of us, to be forged in response to these sorts of overwhelming conditions. Strength is standing tall and firm in the storm, firmly rooted, assured, and unbending. But for one thing, we're not sure we're that strong. And for another, we're not sure we want to be. And lastly, we're not even sure that if we were, we'd withstand every storm. Aesop had a different idea of strength in the tale of the oak and the reed. That is the story of the tall, proud oak tree who stands on a riverbank next to a bunch of reeds in the water and mocks their small size and pliability. It's a mean oak tree who smugly talks about how it can withstand even great winds while the reeds bend in even the slightest breeze. The reeds respond that they bow so that they don't break, but the oak doesn't buy that until a great storm breaks the oak while the reeds live on. By bending, by being flexible, being pliable, leaning with the conditions they live. Rather than fight the wind, they remain calm before it and thus remain rooted while the mighty oak falls in the fight. That same teaching is voiced often using greater and lesser trees and plants as the characters in many secular and religious traditions. In the Talmud, it's a cedar tree with reeds and the winds were blowing because they were angry. So they were just being blustery because they were mad, kind of like I get when I'm hungry or my stealers lose. The reeds didn't fight the bluster, they just sort of ignored it until it was over. The cedar tree, however, fought the winds, fought the anger, and thus fed the anger, and thus strengthened the anger until the anger was strong enough to topple the tree. One of the lessons is that anger strengthens anger, and by extension, hatred strengthens hatred. Judgment leads to more judgment, etc. And more happily, that compassion strengthens compassion, patience strengthens patience, and love teaches and grows love. In the often justice-centered justice world of Talmudic commentary, how one resists is as important as if one resists. For if in resisting we employ the tactics that create the sickness that we are fighting, we are actually strengthening the sickness. And so if we mimic unjust and untrue tactics, we are creating a more unjust and untrue world, no matter our cause. The discipline taught is to be firm and clear, but also flexible and calm. Bending so that one doesn't break is a good strategy. Returning understanding for anger, peace for bluster and love for hatred is what changes the world in the ways that we want. Or how we are approached is not necessarily how we should respond if we are approached with ill intent. The Tao Te Ching sees strength in calmness and flexibility as well. Throughout the work, strength is thought of more as water than rock, more as being pliable and shifting shapes and taking different forms than being rigid and unbending. For example, one, trans one translation of chapter 76 reads, newborn, we are tender and weak. In death, we are rigid and stiff. Living plants are supple and yielding. Dead branches are dry and brittle. So the hard and unyielding belong to death and the soft and pliant belong to life. An inflexible army does not triumph. An unbending tree breaks in the wind. Thus the rigid and inflexible will surely fail while the soft and flowing will prevail. Here too is the teaching the teaching is of a strength found in a kind of suppleness, a certain grace that moves with a life of its own, like a newborn in a sea of larger life, which that newborn depends on. And the shifting and moving with the storms and chaos is a way of living through rather than being overcome by those storms. It's a strength that understands that life is elementally interconnected, that all of who we are is formed in relationship with larger life before us, with us, and even with our dreams about what is to come. And with so much unknown and so much beyond our control, there are times these ancient wise ones and traditions tell us when the strong, centered, and sustaining move is to be flexible, to bend a little, to stay calm, and to wait out the surely ending storm. That doesn't mean that we do nothing, although it could mean that sometimes staying grounded and rooted in being the people we want to be is everything we can do. 
like George Costanzo's father on Seinfeld, sometimes chanting serenity now in the midst of storms of anger and disappointment. Sometimes that is the healthiest response we can offer. And when that is the case, then may it be so. Put me entering a traffic circle when I'm behind someone who is supposed to merge into the circle and move along, but won't because there's a car a mile away going 15 miles an hour that will eventually be in that circle, perhaps by the time my third grader graduates high school. And you may very well hear an old serenity now uttered from my lips. But that keeps me from laying on the horn and being demonstrative. And in general, I think the world would be better with fewer horns and fewer demonstrations of impatience. Even if I am absolutely right and they are not, I should be calm and bendy and go with the flow. That's who I want to be, so I should act like it, especially when I'm tempted to act otherwise. After all, the Tao Te Ching, the Talmud, and Aesop all tell me not to respond to a storm by creating a greater storm. But that first story does give us an additional approach to remaining calm in the storm. One doesn't always need to only wait it out. One can also do what one can do, which may not be to end the storm, but might be to build a path through it. Many of our most difficult moments are really cumulative experiences that collect several things happening all at once. Work, family, schools, bills, relationships of all sorts, big changes in health, home, and marriage, sometimes all at once, is a recipe for the kind of storms that can overwhelm us. But taken bit by bit, they might not be as large and overwhelming as they seem. And maybe there's one thing to do that can lend one a sense of calmness or agency, and then there's one more and another. Maybe it's like those monks who had no idea what to do in that storm, but saw the villagers making a path and decided that that's what they could do as well. Just one stone on either side wouldn't get them through the storm, nor would just two, nor would even just three, but one stone and then one more and then one more again and again would. It's wonderful when the weather clears up really quickly and the sun comes out and the birds sing and the storm ends and all is well. But in the inner life, it's usually not that sudden. The light grows gradually, the clouds slowly dissipate. And in the meantime, we can do the small things that make more manageable, overwhelming conditions. Sometimes that might mean doing something for ourselves. Sometimes it might mean doing something for others. Sometimes it might be reaching out for friendship and conversation. Sometimes it might mean witnessing someone going through their own storms and inviting them out for coffee. In any case, the path through the storm can be built piece by piece, step by step, until the storm ends and the sun shines again and the air is calm and our own calmness helped that come about. In the Hebrew scriptures, when Elijah faces a great storm in his life, he flees into the wilderness and more or less just gives up. And he falls asleep until an angel awakens him and gives him no good news, just tells him to eat something. Elijah eats what the angel offered him and then the angel lets him sleep some more before waking him up again and saying, you need to eat more, you need your energy. It's one of my favorite passages, not just because it gives scriptural license to napping and snacking, but because it's an angel who could be any of us or anyone telling someone who's overwhelmed, you, could eat, you should eat something, and then providing the food like a casserole or a hot dish or some soup brought to the home of someone going through something. That same angel has visited me too, and probably you, and you've probably been that angel with food and company and kindness. And then there's a great wind, but God doesn't speak to Elijah in the great wind. And then there's an earthquake, but God doesn't speak to Elijah in the earthquake. And then there's a fire, but God doesn't speak to Elijah in the fire. And then there's silence, no storm, no chaos, no trouble, just a pause. And God speaks to Elijah there in the quietude. And Elijah receives presence and direction. It's in cultivating silence, 
even when life's storms rage, that we can find some presence, direction, or mindfulness. Not necessarily stillness, for maybe the stones can still be placed and the path still journeyed, but a certain cultivated and learned calmness can make room for the still small voice that reminds us of who we are and who we wish to be. Maybe not the voice of God, maybe of agency, of conscience, of possibility, of memory, Maybe a voice that reminds us that the storm is not the first one we've faced, nor will it be the last, nor is it the only one known even in this moment, but it is one that we can, step by step and stone by stone, make it through. Especially if we build the path with others we know and look toward others we don't and move through flood and tempest toward each other. For only then, in that union of work and concern, will the rewards of life and of living together be fully known. May it be so, and amen. Go forth grateful for the moments before you, the breath within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you toward lives of love and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with everyone else by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace, and amen.